We have, uh, we have some really, really wonderful things that are happening this morning. You have, you have see, already seen a little bit of it as far as a celebration of a testimony and a baptism. And, uh, and not only that, but we have something else that, it, that we are, are getting to celebrate as part of our service this morning. And that's the ordination of, of a pastor. Uh, Joseph Ferno has been working literally over the last three years. We've sent him through a really, really, he in, in indicated a, a desire to be ordained. And we've, for the last three years, been uh, assigning him to study the whole issues of doctrine. He's written 13 papers on his beliefs. Uh, last weekend, he stood before a commission of, uh, of pastors and elders and really defended his faith. And, uh, and we, as a commission, affirmed him unanim and unanimously and, uh, and are privileged as a church to, to now officially recognize him and ordain him as a pastor. And uh, so it is worth celebrating. Joseph, I'm going to ask you several questions uh, because, again, this is something that you're doing. You know, you're making a commitment. This isn't something not only that we are recognizing, but you're making a commitment of yourself uh, as far as your, your doctrine, your beliefs, your practice. And so I'm going to ask you several questions in front of this community of God's people. Do you believe the scriptures of the Old New Testament to be the word of God and the only infallible rule of faith and practice? I do. And do you affirm the principles of doctrine as stated in the, faith, in the statement of faith of Community Church of Portage Lakes as, as your own? I do. Do you promise to lead as a pastor through the example of submission to the leadership of Christ as lived out in practice through a submission in your own life and doctrine to the authority of the word of God and through your submission to the leadership of the church where God has placed you? I do. Do you promise to be zealous and faithful in maintaining the truths of the gospel and the purity, the peace, and the unity of the church, whatever persecution or opposition may arise to you on that account? I do. And you promise to be faithful and diligent in the exercise of all your duties as a follower of Christ and as a pastor of his church, whether personal or relational, public or private. And you now vow to endeavor by the grace of God to adorn the calling as pastor in the manner of, uh, pa pastor in your manner of life, and thus seek, seek to lead and teach through the example of your pi piety before those whom God has given you the responsibility to lead as a pastor. I do. What I'd like to do is ask uh, the, the elders of our church, those that are active and those that are inactive. I think we also had a, a pastor that is, was with uh, Joseph. He, I don't know if, if Happy's here today, but if, if he is, if he'd come. I know he was a part of one of youth pastors, was part of that commission. Because this is also something that's even broader, I'm going to ask if there are any other ordained pastors that are not, not even part of our church, but if you're here and if you would like to be a part of this, to come and join us because we're really setting them aside as a pastor to be recognized not only here but throughout. And I'm going to ask you, Joseph, to kneel. And, um, and what we want to do is to come alongside and to pray and really set apart uh, Joseph for this ministry. Father, I thank you so much for Joseph. I thank you for this young man. Father, I thank you that as, uh, that as he sought this out, Father, that ultimately the, the greatest evaluation that we gave wasn't just his theology, but Father, it was his heart and his practice and the character of his calling. And Father, I thank you that we have gotten to know him and we have, have as a church, fallen in love with him as a young man, as a pastor. And Father, that we're able to affirm, uh, again, not only his, his, uh, his doctrine, but Father, his calling and his commitment to Christ. And Father, I thank you. I thank you. And as we stand around him now, Father, I pray that you would, you would just affirm in his heart both the, uh, the support that he will have from you and from your people over the years to come, yes. but Father, also the accountability to you and your people. That, Father, that there have been people that stood around him and upheld him. And, Father, that there will be people that will likewise challenge him. And, Father, I pray that you would now empower him. I mm -hmm. pray that your spirit would come upon him. Yes. And, Father, that you would set him apart as a pastor, as a man of God. Yes. Father, that your spirit would give him abilities that he does not have. That you would give him an, uh, endurance that goes beyond his, his, his own natural uh, uh, ability. Yes, Lord. That, Father, that you would give him a commitment to truth and even a willingness to be able to stand on that truth, even when it's hard, even when it costs him. Father, that you would give him the character to be able to teach not only true doctrine, but true practice through not only his words, but through his life. Mm -hmm. yes. Father, that you would raise him up and that you would bless him and his family through this ministry. 
Father, we set him apart now in the name of the Lord, and we pray for your blessing upon him and upon all that he does in the years to come. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Joseph, you love you. Love Proud you of you. And that is worth celebrating. And it is. He's done a tremendous amount of work. Now, Joseph, I'm not going to leave you yet. You can sit down. But, but I want to, before we get to the message, I want to take a few moments to really have a message that's, that's again, God's word is applicable to all of us, but specifically to you. Um, we celebrate this publicly, a celebration of this ordination. And, um, and, I, and I pray that God will continue to bless you. But I want to challenge you from God's word in a passage that I think is a challenge of what it means to be faithful in the years and by God's grace, the decades to come. It's a passage that, uh, that I know you're familiar with. You actually spoke on it a couple months ago, and that's 2 Timothy 4, uh, 1 through 5. And the context of the passage is what I think makes it really relevant. Uh, it's Paul's last words, his last challenge to his son in the faith, Timothy. Now, it's, it's relevant not because I'm thinking I'm about to die and it's my last words, and I hope that's not the case. And, um, it's relevant because it's Paul's last words, not only to Timothy, but I think to any that would serve as a pastor. He writes this, I charge you in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing of his kingdom, to preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, repro- reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete, uh, complete patience and teaching. And so he talks this great challenge of saying, okay, I'm challenging you. And, and you know, with, from the perspective that, you know, that from, you know, we don't know how many days we have. And when we're here and we're in these days that God has given us, now be faithful to preach the word. Preach the word in season when it's popular and out of season when it's not popular. Preach the word in a way that repu- reproves, rebukes, exhorts, that's, that's not just affirming, but that's challenging, that's speaking God's word in such a way that at times is going, going, going to go against the culture, go against things that are popular, but in a way that speaks God's truth in a way that we need to hear. It's preaching without compromise. And, and, and I tell you, even personally, I, I'm going to challenge you that I, I, I believe in not only preaching the word in general, but specifically, I believe in a way that's, that's, that's referred to expository, that, it, that a big part of your teaching should be the commitment to preaching God's word systematically, to, to look at sections of the Bible and break it down. And, and here's one of the reasons why. It's because what we've realized, the Bible talks about, you know, the Bible is kind of our food, our spiritual food. And, and it is true that as a pastor, it's my job to prepare a meal. And, you know, you hope if you come here on a Sunday morning that I've prepared a meal for you. And that's part of your job as a pastor. But what we have to realize is that our job isn't just to prepare the meal. It's to prepare the people so they can fix their own meals. You see, I think about this as a child, or as a parent with little children. I remember when my, my, my kids were little babies, you know, and I would try to teach them to be able to eat and you know, first of all, you know, they're eating, you know, breast milk, and then you try to fix little cereals for them, and then you try to get them to be able to, you know, cut, you know, cut up a fruit and bread, and you try to get them to eat, and you're trying to get them to eat more mature things, and the Bible calls us to be, you know, become people who are not just on milk, but that learn to eat meat. You see, but what we've got to realize is that my, my, my challenge as a parent wasn't just to get my kids to eat meat, it was to get them to be able to, to fix their own meal. Because the fact of the matter is that I've not accomplished what I need to as a parent if I've got, taught them to be able to eat meat, but they're still coming to my house every day when they're 40 or 50 years old. You know, I failed somehow along the way. You know, I want them to be able to figure out how to earn their, earn their, own, you know, earn their own money and to go out and be able to prepare their own meal. And the same thing's true for us as, as pastors, that our job is not only to be able to prepare a good meal, but to show people how it's prepared. See, early in that same book, Paul said this, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved as a work who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the the word of truth. See, it's not only our job to rightly handle the word of truth, it's it's our job to prepare those that are under our leadership that over time they learn to do the same thing. And um, now, 2,000 years ago, Paul said something that, that was true then, and it's every bit as true now and becoming more so. He says this, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, uh, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and they will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off to myths. 
Now, this is something that's definitely true today. It's become less and less popular to preach the truth. At times, you know, if we say what is true, you know, that's rejected as being hateful, and, and you have people that are you know, out there, and I found it interesting, even there was a big controversy this past couple weeks with Karen Pence teaching a Christian school, and you have, um, you have a popular singer saying that, well, that's not true Christianity. You know, Lady Gaga is lecturing us on what Christianity is, and I'm not sure that's really the case, but there are people who believe her version of Christianity more than, than the traditional view of Christianity. It's not that popular. And the fact is, even when it's not popular, proclaim the truth. And I want to tell you, I, I received probably one of the greatest compliments I have ever received a couple months ago. And, and I share this because, again, it's, I think it's, I want it to be a challenge to you. There's a uh, a family that had attended here for a number of years. They moved away about four or five years. And, uh, and the young man came to the church a couple months ago. It was a surprise. I hadn't seen him in a while. He, they moved to Cincinnati. And so we got talking. And, and, he, and he told me that he was here for a funeral. And he said, in fact, it's the second funeral. Now, he's in his mid-30s. And so it's a surprise that he's got two friends that have passed away in the, in the course of a month. And he says, so I'm here. And he says, I'm really struggling. He says, I'm, I'm looking at it, and I've got these two friends that, as best as I know, had no interest in God. And he says, Pastor Mike, I want you to tell me, are they in heaven or are they in hell? And he says, I'm struggling with this, not only with where they're at, but you know, I'm, I'm feeling guilty because I never shared and I, I never taught them about, about Christ. And, and, and I'm struggling with this. And he said, I'm looking at all these passages online, and all of them are making me feel better. But I realize I don't want to feel better. I want to know the truth, and I know that you'll tell me the truth. He said, I know you'll tell me, and it's, that's the compliment, that he says, I, I know you're not going to tell me what I want to hear, what's going to feel good, I know you're going to tell me the truth. What does the Bible say about this? And Joseph, I share that because I hope that that's what you want to hear, that you want to be able to say, I'm going to sp speak the truth, the truth in grace, and the truth in love, but the truth, because speaking the truth is always loving, even if it's not always perceived to be so. I know even when you look at this, it's, um, this passage, you know, it's something that, that's a challenge for, for each person here. You see, I hope that you're committed to being at a church that, that speaks the truth, not what we want to hear, not that always affirms and agrees with everything that you say. Um, in fact, I talked to, again, a young man a number of years ago, and he was saying, I think I'm, I'm at the wrong church. And I asked him why. He says, well, because every time I leave, I feel encouraged. And he says, I'm starting to realize that there are part of me that needs to be not encouraged, but needs to be convicted. And if, there's nobody, if they're never saying anything convicts me that I disagree with, that I don't like, it's not challenging me to grow. Well, and that's part of what he's saying here is that God's word, we're supposed to speak it in a way that exhorts and, exert and, and, and challenges growth. And, and, and he, you know, if you look at it and say, well, I don't like necessarily that message or what they say, I want to give you a little hint. I don't always like everything that I say. I mean, the fact is, I don't like everything that I send my messages, and the reason is because my messages don't come from my own opinion or my own likes or my own wants. It really comes from God's Word, and there are times that I study God's Word, and it challenges me. It challenges me on things that I don't want to see or that I don't like or that I'm uncomfortable with, and I've got to communicate not what I like, not my opinions, but God's Word, and let Him speak to me, and then let Him speak that out through to others as well. And so I challenge and encourage you all to be committed to that. And, and for those that are involved, to hold us, to hold me, to hold Joseph accountable to that commitment to God's word. Joseph's closing words are from Paul to you as a pastor. As for you, always be sober-minded. Endure suffering. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. And God has set you apart for this ministry. And I pray and, and hope by God's grace that you will be faithful to it. And it won't always be easy. And I, and I will tell you, there have been times that it has been costly to be faithful to God's word. Um, but God will bless you because of it. And I hope it, and, and pray that at the end of your ministry, you'll look back and you see lives that are impacted because, because you've been faithful. And God's blessed that faithfulness. So let me just close in prayer for you, and then we're going to have a, a shorter message this morning. I'm not going to do a whole main message. You're going to be like, man, we're never going to get out of here. Uh, let me pray. Father, thank you so much for Joseph. I thank you for this young man. Father, for the privilege it is to be able to, to minister alongside of him and for the way that you have grown him and blessed him. Father, I pray for your blessing on him and his ministry. Father, keep him faithful. And use him in that faithfulness, Father, as you, as, you, as you bring through him the power of God's word 
that change lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm not going to read the whole passage this morning. It's maybe a familiar passage, uh, but some of you may know it. It's the story of the walls of Jericho and the walls, you know, the walls coming down of Jericho. And, um, and, and you know, one of the things that I even think about, though, as we think about this whole passage is, is, you know, I was blessed with the privilege as a child of being raised in a Christian home. And my parents came to Christ when I was about five years old, and, and they were committed to the church, and they you know, brought us to Sunday school regularly. And, and it's interesting to think about things that I was taught and the way I was taught, and, and now to look at, at kids' ministries. My kids would come home and to see what's taught now. And some things have changed, some things haven't changed. Some one of the things that's changed is technology. You know, I think about when I was young, the, the technology of teaching was the flannel graph. And uh, some of you might remember the flannel graph. You know, for those who are under 50, you've never heard of that. And, and it's just this board that has a flannel cloth that's on top of it. And then they have these cutouts of these, you know, different people that they stick on the board and they kind of move them around as they're telling the story. And, um, and, and what's funny is that I even looked at this and I wondered about flannel graphs. And I said, do people still use them? And I looked it up online. And there's a lot of companies that still make flannel graphs. They're all for churches. And, you know, I'm kind of like, okay, well, maybe we're not as, a, you know, the church is a little still further behind than we thought. And, and uh, you know, but we look at this and you say, no matter where we're at, it's not the how, but, you know, a lot of the what has continued to stay the same. The things that I was taught or what my kids are taught, they, you know, we're often taught a big emphasis is the Bible. And so they go through periods where it's one year it's the New Testament, one year it's the Old Testament. And we see these same stories. And when I thought about this, I thought about, you know, these stories that I learned as a child, especially in the Old Testament. A lot of times the stories that I was really drawn to were kind of these stories of these great miracles that God did in the Old Testament period for the people of Israel. You know, things like Moses and the 10 plagues that freed the people from Egypt and the parting of the Red Sea and the destruction of the walls of Jericho. And you see these great stories you know, but one of the things that I started to think about when I got a little older is, boy, these are great stories of how God worked for the people of Israel, but what do they mean for me today? How do, how do we apply them in our lives today? Because the stories seem to focus on what God did then in a very, very different context, and it was hard to figure out what they meant for what God was doing now in my context. I mean, yeah, they're great stories of God's miracles, but... You know, how many of us are likely to face a great city with 10-foot walls or a 10-foot giant like Goliath? I mean, those things aren't things we likely face. And so I remember, you know, reading through, several years ago, reading through the Old Testament and devotionally, and, and I was struggling with this question of what these things mean today. Now, from some of you that are here regularly, you know that periodically I'll talk about, you know, rules of interpreting the Bible. And, uh, you know, often refer to the first rule of interpreting the Bible as scripture interprets scripture. And, and so you've heard me say that. And, and actually, there's a number of rules. In, in fact, I'm, I'll give you a little plug here. Um, we're going to be doing a Sunday evening class starting February 17th. There's some information in the bulletin about how to study and understand the Bible. And the first couple of weeks are really looking at these basic rules for interpreting scripture. And, and they're basic rules, if you understand them and you apply them, they help the Bible become a whole lot more understandable. And, and one of the rules, the first rule, Scripture interprets Scripture, but one of the rules in there as well is a rule that deals with the Bible's practical applicability. Now, part of what this rule means is that God has ordained the writing of His Word so that it's not only understandable, but it's also constantly practical and applicable in nature. The purpose of the Bible isn't just to tell stories, nor is it even just to even teach truths certain, through certain stories. It's always to teach certain truths about God, about who we are, truths that we should then apply to our lives so that we then think differently, act differently. And, and a different way of saying this is one of the main questions you should always ask in every passage, every time you study, is the theological question, so what? You know, so what? What does this mean? How do we apply it? And the fact is that if I study the Bible and I can say, boy, God did this, and, but I can't answer so what, then I really haven't understood what it means because it's always applicable. Now, when we apply this, to our, this rule to the study of these great miracles in the Old Testament, what it's teaching us then is they're not just teaching us about how God worked in the past. 
It's not always about how God worked then, but it's always teaching us about how God works now, how he works in our lives today. And yes, it's true that we may not face the specific problems that they faced. We're not going to face the 10-foot giant. We're not going to necessarily face you know, the Red Sea and the parting. We're not going to face those exact situations. And, and we may not be called to do something like walking around a wall seven times. And, and we may not be called to do exactly that. But there's something in there. There's a truth that's being taught in there that's something that he wants us to understand and apply and live out our lives today. So let's look at that one example. That's the wall of Jericho, Joshua chapter 6. Now, we're going to just sum this up because we have a very limited time. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But, but let me, before we get into the you know, main part of the story, let's give you some context. Um, Joshua 6 is, is, you know, is, is after Moses has passed away. Moses had been the leader of Israel. He had taken them to the very edge of the promised land. Forty years earlier, he had brought them to the edge of the promised land. And he had sent some spies into the promised land to, to search things out. And to say, okay, now we're, you know, we're going to, you know, God's given us this land and let's search it out and see what, you know, what God's going to do. And in Deuteronomy 1, we're told that they reported back the people are stronger and taller than we are. The cities are large with walls up to the sky. And so that was the report. And this report scared the people of Israel. And in spite of God's promise to them that he would protect them, that he would give them victory, they, they rebelled and they decided, you know, decided, you know, we're not going there. We're not going to proceed. And as a result, God punished them by calling them to then wander in the wilderness for 40 years before he would bring them back and say, okay, now I'm going to fulfill my promise. So now the 40 years of wandering is over. Mo Moses has died. God has appointed Joshua as the new leader. And once again, the people of Israel have come to the border of this land that God has promised him. And now once again, the, the leader, now Joshua, has sent some scouts into the land to scout the land before they, they go there. And, and the first part they come to is the city of Jericho. And Jericho was likely the largest and strongest of the cities. It's the big city that's there at the beginning of that border. It is the, you know, it is the, you know, the ultimate city, the dominant city in that area. And what God now gives them is something that seems to them to be an impossible task. He says, okay, well, we're going to conquer the city of Jericho. Now, what you've got to realize is they go to the city, and the city is enormous. And it's got these enormous walls. And these walls are, you know, um, you know people have, when we think of walls, we might think of like, you know, gates and wood walls and things like that. These were not wood walls. These were enormous stone walls. Archaeologists have found the, you know, the base of the walls. They're, they're huge walls, and most people believe you know, they were actually on a ramp, but they were between 25 to, to 36, I'm sorry, 35 to 46 feet high. Now, again, now you think about like this as high as this is up here. Okay, these are giant walls. These are, you know, higher than this possibly. And not only are they really tall, but they're wide. We're told in the story that there was a, um, you know, Joshua 2.15, that Rahab the prostitute, that her, her house was built into the wall. So it was wide enough for people to live in, actually live in the wall. You know, there, again, historically we're told that there would be numerous chariots that could actually ride side by side on that wall. Now think about this. Here you have these people, the children of Israel, they've come from Egypt. Egypt didn't have any walls. Egypt was the dominant air, you know, country in that area. They didn't need any walls. It was like nobody was going to attack. So they had never seen this before, and suddenly they come up to the city, and there's these enormous walls and God says, okay, I want, you to, I want you to defeat them. And that's when you read that, it under, makes sense that when the first group of spies came back, they said, what? The cities are large with walls up to the sky. We can't do this. That makes sense. Now, we might look at this and say, okay, again, what does it have to do with me? I mean, we're not called to conquer something like Jericho. We don't face great walls. But what we've got to realize is that the Bible, again, remember the rule of the Bible's practical applicability. Does God ever call you into an impossible situation? See, don't, let's not think about walls. Think about the impossible challenges that you would face. The things that are so far, so great that you can't even imagine. How could we ever get past that? How can I ever accomplish that? That's so much bigger than I can imagine. You know, let me even take some things that seem impossible, but, you know, but probably are a whole lot smaller than that. For some, you might be just sitting there and saying, how do I stay in this marriage? 
How do, I, how do I have a marriage that honors God? It's falling apart. My spouse has put up walls. How does that survive? You know, God, I want, I want to build healthy relationships. I want to be able to have friends. I want to be able to forgive. But you don't understand how they betrayed me. I can't do that. That's impossible. You know, God, God, you want me to honor you with the lifestyle. But you don't understand. I mean, I've been dealing with this temptation. I've been dealing with this addiction for years. And there's no way in the world I could ever overcome it. There's no way in the world that I could ever, or God, I'm praying for this loved one and they're dealing with the addictions. They're, they're close to the gospel. These things are impossible. Well, I want you to realize that this all t- talking about the fact that it's not only that God worked then, but God works now. And don't get focused on the physical walls then, recognizing it's saying that we all face impossible things, impossible tasks. And God is a miraculous God that works beyond it. Now let's look at what his strategy then was. Because he has, a, he's an, um, he has an incredible strategy, an illogical strategy. strategy. I'm sorry, I, I kind of forgot to up, update this. So, it's, so what are, what's his illogical strategy? So look at verse two, and two, through, uh, two through five. Verse two, the angel says to the Lord, uh, said to Joshua, see I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and its mighty men of valor. He starts to saying, okay, I've given it in your hand. And notice it's past tense. It's not, I will give it, it's I have given it. This is already decided in God's eyes. And so he says, okay, well, that's great. There's this bat- you know, battle that's won, but here's the part that you have to do. Now look at verse, verse three. You shall march around the city and all the men of war going around the city once, and you shall do that for six days. Seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. On the seventh day, you will march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets and when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, you will hear the sound of the trumpet, and all the people will shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall flat, and the people shall go up, everyone straight before him. Now here's, now we we've read this, and, and again, if you grew up in Sunday school and you heard this story, you're like, oh yeah, it's a great story. Think about the people that were there. Think about what this is actually saying. Try to read this experientially. Think about, here you've got, the angel comes to Joshua, says, okay, Joshua, God's given you this. Here's the plan. Now go tell the people. And so Joshua comes to the people and he says, all right, I've got great news. God has spoken to me. He's given us Jericho. And they're like, yeah, all right. You know, God's given us Jericho. And he says, not only that, he's given me his plan of attack. He's told me how he's going to do it. Here's what, and they're all cheering. They're all excited. And then he starts to lay out the plan. Okay, we're going to go out and we're going to walk around this the wall for, you know, once a day for six days. And then the last day we're going to get up really early, we're going to walk around seven times, and then we're all going to shout. And then the walls are going to fall in. And they're like, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, you just go, okay, Joshua, that's really funny. Um, uh, you know, tell us what's really happening. Tell us what God's plan really is. And no, that's right. And, and they're all sitting there, they're, you know, they're like, there's no way in the world. This makes no sense. That's not how you conquer a walled city. We, we've never done this before, but we know that's not the way to do it. And then you think about it, think practically. They go out and they start walking around the wall. Remember, the people of Jericho have heard about the people of Israel. They've been fearful of them, but suddenly you have these million people. They start walking around the wall, and they're just walking. What do you think the people inside the wall are doing? You know, they're not just sending out, you know, bread and, hey, we're hoping, you know, we're glad to have you. No, they're, I mean, they're shouting at them. They're, they're probably, you know, if, if they're within arrows reach, they're shooting things at them. They're mocking them. They're laughing at them. You know, in the middle of this, you've got all these people that are sitting there saying, why are we doing this? Now, here's what I want you to realize. There's some principles here. Why was this so hard to do? I think number one, people didn't really believe that God could conquer a city without using military might. How could God conquer a city without any swords? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Two, when he did command them to do something, it didn't make sense because there was no logical correlation between walking around a wall and defeating a city. It seemed like they were just doing something that had no purpose, that made no sense. And three, they wanted to be involved in the battle you know, okay, let us be involved. They wanted to get some of the credit. You see, but there were three things that God was trying to teach them. Number one is that the battle was won by his power alone, not theirs. That it was his battle. Number two, that in commanding them to do something that made no sense, he was testing them. He was testing them to see if they really believed in his resources. He was basically saying, if, you know, if you do nothing, 
You know, if I just came and did it, then you don't have to demonstrate any belief. But if, on the other hand, if you do something logical, then you could say, well, my effort helped bring the result. So what I'm going to call you to do is something that seems totally illogical, because it's going to show that you believe in me, but it's going to at the same time prove that when the battles won in this matter, it was me that won the battle. Okay, let's think about this. See, again, this is not about how God worked then. It's how God works now. How do we apply the truths of God's past work to our lives today? See, what we've got to realize is the same principles are true in our lives today. The, the, the greatest and most important battles that we fight will be won by God's power, not ours. The things that we think that are these great walls, these great barriers, these things that we wonder how we could get through, they're going to be won by God's power. And when God calls us to now depend upon his strength, what we have to realize is at times he will give us commands that don't make any sense, that don't seem to have any logical correlation. Because what, what he's calling us to do is he's calling us to test our faith, not our ability. You see, if it's going out there and I'm going to go out and try, you know, I'm going to go out and do all that I can, and God help me, well, then if I succeed, it was because my effort and my ability, and God helped me a little bit. But times God will call and give us illogical commands because he says, I don't want to see whether you can do it. I want to see if you have faith that I can do it. And so I'm going to call you to do something that makes no sense because the question is, do you trust my power? Because if I say, well, I'm going to do it with you doing nothing, well, then I don't have any faith. It doesn't grow my faith anyway. If God calls me to do it in a way that's logical, then again, I'm going to walk away thinking it was my accomplishment. But what he does is he calls us to do something illogical, something that seems to have no connection to what we're actually seeking to accomplish. He calls us to walk around the walls. And how does he call us to walk around the walls? How did, what, what's that look like? You know, he, he calls us to walk around the walls simply this. Fighting a battle that in ways that doesn't make any logical sense, there's no correlation between, between, in that case, walking around the wall and defeating the city. In the same way, we face a powerful enemy. But the scripture says, what is that powerful enemy? Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. And he says, okay, we've got this. And he calls us to do something just as illogical from a human perspective. He calls us to pray. That's what prayer is. You know, that's when I was, remember studying this and I realized this is such a powerful illustration of prayer because there are times that I will pray and I will pray and I will pray and it's like, man, it feels like, you know, my prayers are just hitting the ceiling and nothing is happening and God, I have this incredible battle. Why am I wasting my time praying? Because I've got to do something that makes a difference. And God said, no, I want you to demonstrate your faith, not your ability. I want you to demonstrate not that you have the ability to fix this with my help, but the faith that you believe that I can do the miracles. And if I called you to do nothing, then you really wouldn't be trusting in me. But in calling you to do something that doesn't seem to make sense, what you're showing is you're showing faith in not your ability or not hope, but faith in God's ability. So God wants us to fight battles. He wants us to be a church that impacts our community. He wants us to be a people that have marriages that stand the test of time and honor him. He wants us to be people that interact in the culture that we see reversals and issues like, you know, we see miracles and, and issues like addiction like we saw in the testimony this morning, that we see lives being changed. He wants us to reach unsaved loved ones. He wants us to, to do all these things. And how does he call us to do it? By praying. And at times we feel like we're talking to the air, just like the Israelites felt like, man, we're just walking around the city. It's not accomplishing anything. And it's hard to do. But what we have to realize is just like the Israelites, you know what happens? A lot of times we walk around it day and day after day three and day four, and nothing happened. Nothing happened six days. Nothing happened six times around the seventh day until the seventh, seventh day. And here's the hard part for us. If God were to tell us, if you were to pray this long and then the walls come down, that'd be a whole lot easier. <laughs> you know what's really hard is God doesn't tell us when, when the walking ends. And for many of us, we've had those times where we prayed and we said, God, work right away. And we're like, praise God. And, and what we're re, you know, re celebrating today, even with these baptisms, is these are our, our answers to prayer. And we praise God because God does that. And we're praying with a week of prayer. We're, we're, we want to celebrate answers to prayer because, because there are times we need to realize that there, there, here are examples of walls that are falling down. But for those of us in the middle, see, I encourage you to realize that 
there will be days that God will call us just to be faithful and to walk around the wall, to just continue to seemingly send our words up in the air and nothing seems to happen. And, and what we're doing is we're, we're obeying God and taking up the battle unconventionally, not doing things that make sense, not doing things that, that seemingly are going to have any impact by our ability, but doing things that God calls us to. The illogical strategy of fighting a battle, of doing things that are being faithful to Him, that are demonstrating our, our trust in Him, not our trust in our own ability. And being faithful, continuing to walk around, continuing to pray, when nothing seems to happen because we believe that if we continue to walk around, if we continue to pray, that God will in time answer the prayer. And for those that, you know, that, that are wondering, well, how do I know if God wants the prayer? I want to tell you, especially for those that, you know, we're lost, and this is part of, and part of my theology. We could, you know, we could talk more about it later on. And here's, you know, you say, how do you know God's going to answer the prayer? How do we, how can we pray with confidence? And this is one of the things that I really believe that's, that's part of understanding, a full understanding of theology and, and prayer. You know, one of the, the biggest hints, especially when I think of praying for unbelief, uh, loved ones, you know, how do I know they're ever going to come? How do I know God's ever going to bring them to saving faith? You know, there's always a clue. There's always a foreshadowing of when God wants to work. And you know what that foreshadowing is? He calls people to pray. He calls people to pray. He calls us to pray, and he leads us to pray for the things that he wants to do so that we have a chance to participate. He didn't need the people to walk around the wall. He could have done that without, but he wanted to build their faith. And so he called them to participate. And when they did what God had called them to do, it was because he already had accomplished that purpose. He had already, he had already said that Jericho was already defeated. My friends, I want to encourage you. There are some of you here that you're say, praying for situations that seem beyond hope. For, for loved ones that seem like they're closed and will never understand, never be open. I want you to realize, stay faithful. Stay faithful, continue to walk around the wall, continue to pray, because in time, God will answer that prayer. And I, I believe the very fact that he's called you to pray makes it even more so. And if you want to even make it more so, then share that request with other people, because the more people we get to pray, the more people get to participate. That's why we have the week of prayer. I want to encourage you, even if you haven't participated in the week of prayer, you know, we've extended it through Friday to give you a chance to do that. We have a special prayer meeting on Wednesday evening. Come out and join us for that. You know, we hope that this is a chance to stretch you in your prayer life because what happens is we're stretched. That's how God works. And it's always a joy to be able to see even the answers of prayer that come out of just this one week when we pray more, when we as a, as a community of God's people commit to say, we're going to spend 100, 150 hours walking around the wall, praying together. It's amazing. The answers to prayer that even will happen this week. So I encourage you. Look at the Old Testament. Be amazed at these great stories. But they're not just great stories of what God did for the people of Israel back then. They're great stories of what God did and how he works today. And specifically, they're great stories that call us to seek his power, sometimes through the most unconventional means, to rely upon not our strength that he, and hope that he helps us, but to rely on his strength by doing something as illogical as praying and then watching him to do the miracle. Thanks for joining us. If you have any questions about what we talked about, Jesus Christ, our church, or anything else, connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, or by email. We'd love to hear from you.